Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grow My Etsy Shop podcast. Hey, so today it's going to be kind of a fun episode. We're going to be doing a shoot from the hip type episode where in my Facebook group, I recently asked the question of like, hey, um, you know, what 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 episodes do you guys want to hear? And I got a, a bunch of comments and I have actually pulled some ideas from these that I'm going to be doing bigger things for. I've already done bigger things for, but I kind of want to just do like a quick round shoot from the hip of some of the other questions that maybe aren't worthy of full episodes, but definitely, you know, want to answer those questions that are found within that group. So this is just in my regular free Facebook group. It's called Grow My Etsy Shop um, group, and you can go to that. And if you haven't joined, you can join that and you will, uh, you'll find this post and you can post something. So there's some, uh, some reasons to join the group. All right. So one of the questions that was asked was organizing business expenses. Now, there are so many different ways to do, to do this and based on how organized you are or how much of um, how much product you're using, like how much stuff is actually going towards your business, it, it can all depend and there's different softwares and Google Sheets to QuickBooks and everything in between. Um, I have found, and this is, I'm a 1099 guy myself, I have found that opening a second bank account that's under my business, having an LLC that's my business, and then just running any anything that is profitable from my business goes into that bank account. Anything that I'm spending comes out of that bank account. Okay, And so initially you're going to make an investment into that bank account and then as hopefully you're running a business that's not losing money every month, you're able to take from that bank account and put back into that bank account. And then at the end of the year, you essentially log into that bank account. You're able to see just go to, you know, money out and you can total up your money out and then you can um, go the other way in. So now, of course, an accountant is going to ask things like, well, how much did you spend on advertising and how much did you spend on products? Because there's a difference between the two. Um, And so that could be there's different ways to go about that. For example, if you could log into your advertising platform and you can look at how much was spent there. I tend to do it like that. I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but I will say it's one of the easier ways to do it because at the end of the day, you know how much money you've made, how much money you've spent and kind of where it's going and you use your bank records to kind of know that. So great question. Thank you. All right. Another question I got, and this is from one of our group experts. If you look at the thread, it says group expert next to it. That's because this individual is has an Etsy shop that's really successful, and I thought she could share a lot of great insights, so I made her a group expert. But she asked the question, best shipping practices, should we purchase shipping labels through Etsy or through another third party? Um, for me personally, I used ShipStation. I found that it did everything that I needed. It was cheap, and you get, obviously, the more postage you buy through these softwares, and in bulk, the cheaper it's going to get. And so uh, I tend to use the software. I've actually never used Etsy's shipping process and so it might be great <laughs> but i use ships ship station and i know a lot of other people use something called pirate ship which i love their marketing pirate ship like get it it's like a pirate ship but you also ship stuff anyway um those are the two that i know of the most and i think they probably have the most functionality i, I don't i wouldn't imagine that etsy's labels would have as much functionality but these they integrate you literally just plug them in and then you hit like a refresh button and it goes boop and everything populates and then you can bulk your stuff and all that kind of stuff and this is a great way someone actually asked the question of like how do I go international like how do I do this kind of stuff and if you're going to be doing international shipping like this these third party softwares are really great for that Um, the only thing you want to be aware of when it comes to to international shipping is Obviously, they're gonna. It's gonna take a lot longer to get their package, but they do know that, and Etsy does a good job at kind of integrating that uh, message to them. So as long as you update that in your Etsy platform, it's going to let them know as well. The next thing you kind of want to know is that there is and can be a customs tax that comes on, and this is it's like so random. Sometimes people pay that tax. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes I get people who say, "Well, the tax was worth more than the package," or whatever it may be. And a lot of that has to do with, um, I think it's the UK, isn't it? I think it's the UK that gets hit the most with that kind of stuff. And realistically, I think the world is getting better at recognizing that they're getting taxed really 
high. But I, I, to be perfectly honest, and I guess I should probably give this point of reference as I'm going into this, I am a growth marketer. My job is to go into businesses and see what they're doing and help them grow. So when it's kind of the day-to-day hustle stuff, I don't normally deal with that stuff, right? And so for me, I had an Etsy shop and my position in my Etsy shop, it was ran by me and my wife. My wife did the day-to-day tasks and I was in charge of the growth and I got us on Amazon and I got us on Etsy and I launched our own websites and I was advertising on social media and I did all of our Pinterest and Googles and that to the point that we were able to be in magazines and then um, ultimately be able to sell our brand. Um, So yes, the day-to-day type stuff I'm not great at and nor and I think there's other people in other podcasts or you can just Google it that could really give you these little day-to-day answers I feel like the value that this podcast has is that we're essentially taking big principles of marketing, digital marketing, and we're placing them into our Etsy store so that we can grow like other online markets. So moral of the story is, yeah, you can ship. There's some tax and stuff. I would Google it. <laughs> That's That would be my answer to that. Um, how do you manage your business when you're managing everything else? Maybe finding ways when your business is picking up, but your life is too. That is a good question. Um, probably should be its own podcast, but I am, and this is just the philosophy of Jared, I am a big believer in life and that life shouldn't be. And I think this is kind of an American slash Canadian culture. I, I I think I've mentioned this. I live in the Dominican Republic. I've lived in Ecuador. I live in Mexico. I've kind of just jumped around and I live a different lifestyle than most Americans. I'm American. I'm originally from California. And the reason for that is that I don't like consumerism of America, that it's just kind of like we buy our track home and then we pack it full of stuff and we spend and we spend and we spend. So I am a believer. I I have, I live simply and I don't, you know, I, all my stuff fits into suitcases and all that kind of stuff. So you're, the reason I tell you that is that that's who you're talking to when you ask that question. I will give you my truthful answer. Can you make money and a good amount of money without working like a dog? Yes. But here's the but you have to invest your time in the beginning and have it be goals of where you're going to be. And then what happens is, so for example, if you were a opening a cleaning business, you would essentially market yourself. People would buy your product and you would go in and clean all the houses. And eventually you're going to get to a point where you're working 40 hours a week cleaning other people's homes. And that's where a lot of people get stuck because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so busy cleaning. I can't do anything else. And they, in their mind say, well, I'm really busy. I don't really want to take on new clients. I don't want people to come knock on my door because I can't take anyone else on at this point. And I don't really want to work more. So they just kind of have their income and they're 40 hours a week that they're working and they're stuck there. What we want to do when we're growing and a lot of what we talk about in this podcast is like, how do we systematize what we're doing so that we don't have to? So in this scenario, this cleaner should really learn how to hire properly and how to start delegating that out so that she's paying someone less than she's getting charging for the home, more or less. And she's able to then put her focus in just growth. So yeah, I had 30 clients I was cleaning for and I was doing it was... 40 hours a week type thing. I've now brought on a second person. I only clean 20 hours a week and I've tripled my business in the process and that kind of stuff. So what's happened at the end of this is that, yeah, she's working half the amount of time. Eventually she's going to get completely out of cleaning and she systematized it. She has employees. And so where's her day? She's, she's learned how to hire. She's learned how to create backup plans in case people don't show up and scheduling and all this kind of stuff. That's where she's moved to the business owner. So for Etsy shop owners, like we don't ever think that far, right? It's like, I have my product and like, it's me. I'm the person who makes the product. And so we, it's so important that you learn how to systematize your marketing because essentially if you're designing all your product and it's all under you, in fact, the girl I just mentioned, the growth expert in my group, I'm going to share this and she knows um, who she is and I know she's probably listening, but she did $100,000 in her first year on Etsy. And you think to yourself, wow, whoa, whoa that's incredible. She, that's, that's so good. And it is so good. But do you know what her secret is? <laughs> she doesn't make the product. Her partner does. So she is in charge of growth. Her partner is in charge of making the product. So when she goes to work every day, she's growing and her partner's doing this. She has figured out how to systematize that growth. 
And so for you, when you are pick, when business is picking up, you need to look at your business and say, what can I delegate out? What process, even if it's an hour a week, find a way to delegate it out. And at that point, you're, if you can just save yourself that time and focus in on what's truly important to the customer or to your growth, that's how it should be done. So finding ways to systematize the internet is great at this. I shouldn't say the internet. Computers are great at this. Software is great at this. Finding ways to systematize what we're doing. I'm recording this podcast, but guess what? You're not going to hear this for weeks after I've recorded this podcast because it goes into a queue that automatically uploads. So on Fridays, I'm not sitting at my computer. Oh my gosh, I got to upload this thing. Oh no, no, no. I am at the beach and this podcast uploads for me. And that's how this kind of works. So I'll be honest with you, today I've recorded four podcasts, four. So I had a block of time, I sat down, I locked my door, and I'm talking, and I'm sharing this stuff, and throughout the week I think about things, I write things down, I do growth reports, I write those down, I think, oh yeah, that person was kind of stuck here, what's a way that I can describe that so other people don't get stuck in those situations, I get all my notes down, I sit down, and now here I am talking out four podcasts. Um, This is me systematizing my business, if I had to do this every week, it, you know, how could I take on more work? If next week's really busy for me, do I fall behind in my podcast? No, because it's systematized. So just like that, and, and sorry, this is kind of a long answer, but there's going to be times you're really busy and there's going to be times you're not so busy. And you don't want to have your workflow flow with that. You want to be able to say like, look, I'm going to, since I'm low, be able to cue out what I'm doing. And so I have things that automatically post on social media for me and all that kind of stuff. So if I, I will share this with you, my gosh, this is kind of turning into just one <laughs> question here. I will share this with you. VAs are very popular right now. And essentially what you can do is um, now this isn't like sweat labor or anything like this, but there are lots of agencies that offer VA support, which stands for virtual assistant and what it is, it's very popular in the Philippines and, and places like this that they learn English. They learn how to do a lot of the daily tasks. They're um, extremely intelligent, I find. And their wage is significantly so, like, for example, they live off of $4 a day or something like that. And so if you can pay a VA $4 an hour, they're doing better than most of the neighborhood in that scenario. And so in our mind, we're like, oh my gosh, $4 an hour is nothing. But for a VA in the Philippines, that money goes a lot farther because it's going to, there's a, um, what's the word? I can't think of the word right now. Where, like, I, I, I live in pesos. And so my, right, in the Dominican Republic. And so my dollar goes a lot further with pesos here. And all, I can't think of that. The conversion rate, there it is. The conversion rate will end up being a lot more money to them. So, I use VAs in my business, especially when things in my growth marketing business, we use VAs for to do things for us so that we are open to continue to grow. And then with that, we can hire more people, we can make more money, we can create more jobs for other people. It's all just good for the for the economy. Okay, so that's that. Um, let me scroll through here because I kind of went on a huge rant on that one. Let's find one. So how to set the right prices? Is it too high, low, etc.? What's a good conversion rate, especially for beginners? So realistically we can't answer that question because yeah what's a good conversion rate well it's like well if you put your stuff up on a billboard a good conversion rate is like 0.0001 if you are walking to a room and there's three fishermen there and you're selling a fishing pole i would assume a good conversion rate would be three um so it changes based on what we're doing but this is what i will tell you if you are new chances are you're priced too high you have to put sweat equity into your business And if you just look at your business and kind of plan out your forever pricing, well, look at this. I want to make this much an hour and I'm going to go out and I'm brand new. You're essentially walking into Etsy and saying, it's like walking into, um, not to use a sporting analogy here, but it's like if you walked into a basketball uh, environment, you know, and you have all these people who've been playing for a long time and if they've got chemistry with each other and you walk in at day one and you're like, hi, I'd like to be the starting point guard, please. They're going to go like, mm, no, yeah, bro. You're going to have to run some laps. You're going to have to run some practices. You're going to play coming off the bench for a while. And eventually, once you prove to us that you are good enough to take that guy's position, then we'll put you in that position. But do you think you can just come up first day and say, I want this? No. The same thing happens to you as an Etsy shop owner. If you walk into Etsy and you're like, hey, how much are the? How much is everyone charging for a product like mine? $20? Great. I'll do mine for $20. 
Send every, all the traffic to me, Etsy. What, you know, and Etsy's going to say have the conversation with you. Of who are we going to bump off to put you, who has no reviews, who hasn't proven to us that customers even like your product or anything like that? So the chances are, if you are new, you're, you're priced too high. You should always come in significantly lower. And those aren't your forever prices. Because your mindset should be, I need sales and reviews to prove to Etsy and consumers that my product is good. Not make money. I'm not in the business of making money. I'm in the business of getting sales and reviews. And once you get sales and reviews, and you've got 50 sales, and you've got, well, actually, you've got 100 sales, you've got 200 sales, and you've got 50 reviews that are coming from that. At that point is when you can start to then raise your prices and then say to other people, hey, point guard, <laughs> I'm good enough. Move aside. I want some playtime. And that's when it's going to actually work. So that's the way I would answer that question. Um, all right. So there's a, there was two questions about copywriting on here. Um, so I actually so I met with someone recently and wrote a real, real big old growth plan out for him. And then I got on the phone with him. And I was like, all right, let's go. And she was like, actually, I'm getting taken down by Etsy like crazy because of all this copywriting stuff. Um, here's how this works. Uh, this is an, this is kind of an interesting subject. Maybe this will be our last question here. At, if, if Etsy truly cared, if they truly, truly, truly cared, when you typed in Disney, they would say, sorry, no searches available for this. However, when you type in Disney, all sorts of Disney stuff pops up. Here's the reason why. If, if you take something and you change it, at that point, it's becoming more of an art. Now, there's this the, the laws get really complicated and it's so... Yeah, it's so complicated, but kind of just in a bird's eye view of this, when you change something, so if you take a Disney princess and you change that princess so that it no longer looks like Cinderella, but your own version of Cinderella, what happens is that becomes part of you. But when you try to sell it as Cinderella or a version of Cinderella, you're essentially taking their image, their likeness, their brand and using it to get sales. And that's where they can kind of edge you and say, hey, wait a second. You're using my branding. I have spent gobs of money on getting Cinderella to be popular. Disney may say this. And you are making money off my Cinderella. Now, you've changed it. So they can't nail you there, but they can nail you. I can't remember the term. It's like this likeness thing that they can get you on. Um, and that's what can get you into some trouble. But what mainly has to happen is that someone has to contact Etsy and report that. So like the girl I was meeting with, legit, it was the lawyers of these country singers that were reaching out to her and Etsy and saying, hey, we don't like that this is up here. And she can. But when we were on the call, we were looking stuff up like you're killing me, Smalls. And there was the literal actor who said you're killing me, Smalls, on a sticker. And that's still up. But her stuff was getting taken down and so it's it's like what's hard is like if you can find that niche that doesn't get taken down that their lawyers I guess just don't care and obviously we know Etsy doesn't care because they allow your stuff to be seen and bought and all this kind of stuff yeah you can go to the moon and you can make a ton of money because those you're essentially hitting really high targeting keywords that a lot of people are scared to be in but on the flip side if you get hit with that, if you get hit with multiple copyright infringements, you just get taken down and they don't let you open up another store. Like they got your bank account, they got all sorts of stuff. And when you try to open up another store, you have to, it, they'll, yeah, they'll say like, no, 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 we know who you are. Nice try. So it's, it's a risk on both ends. Obviously, the best advice I can give you is, well, you might want to avoid that. But I'm also like, I don't know, kind of anti that kind of stuff. And I feel like you should be able to do it. So I respect you if you go that way and support you 100% or if you're just like it's not worth it then I'm a backup but also we don't want to live in fear I'm kind of anti living in fear so anyway that's that um oh my gosh we're we're kind of far in let me see if there's just one more in here that we can do um all right let's start with social media platforms to support the Etsy shop how necessary is it which one do you recommend obviously all at once would be hard to do no and let's say we are over ambitious and do multiple platforms how would you re-edit one post into different oh geez that's like a whole episode in itself let me just say this this will be kind of our ending note anytime you're moving onto social media or starting your social media work with one platform first and then but save your content so if you're posting on instagram save it all 
Don't just post on Instagram and move on with your life. Save your content of everything that you're doing. Save and save and save. And then when you have stuff built up, because what happens is if you post once a week and over two months, you're going to have eight posts on your Instagram. And what person is going to likely follow you with eight posts? But if you can get a hundred posts on your Instagram as fast as you can, then you've got something that people are actually, it actually has content on it and value in it. And then from there you can start working on something else. So if you can, if you want to just shower all of the stuff at the same time. So I do do something similar to that. I use something called social champ. It hooks to Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest and it just kind of pushes content out for me. Um, But I have found that there's really one particular platform that does the best for me and that's Facebook groups and Facebook in general, so I tend to put a lot of my focus in Facebook and get my stuff through there. Sorry, you're hearing all this stuff. I got another job, so my phone is beeping with other with other stuff. Um, okay, that's what I would do, and obviously this is super important to Etsy. Etsy does not want to give you 100% of their traffic, and so by bringing in your own clicks, Etsy does like that and will reward you for that, but on the flip side... If you are doing it all for Etsy, like if it's like, oh, wow, you brought in 70% of your own traffic, then you are, it is time that you get off of Etsy because they are just taking fees for all your hard work and that's not cool. Okay, let's leave that there. I probably do a full episode on that um, and really how that should look because it's something I, I do know a lot about and I currently do within my own business. So I can share that more with you in detail. All right, this was my version of quick off the hip shooting. Um, I think the day that I launch this, I'll put another thread up in the Facebook group. So when you're done listening with this, if you're like, dude, I actually have some questions I would love to, then you can just join the Facebook group and write on that post. And I will do the same thing where I'll either create full episodes off these. Like someone asked about Etsy ads and last week I did a full episode about Etsy ads and there was actually another one in here that I did. I can't remember which one, but, um, so I'll put that in here. You can look at it and post. So go to my group. It's uh, grow my Etsy shop group. Um, on just look it up on Facebook. Okay, thanks so much.